This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. The business world has already discovered that the bottom line improves when a diverse team of managers is assembled within an organization. This is not that hard to understand. The ideas generated to solve problems come from a different set of perspectives and cover more ground. The reactions of employees, customers, and clients to any kind of new products or services are more easily anticipated when a bunch of different people are thinking about them. In medical research, while diversity in both the scientific team and the clinical trial participants might seem obvious, it hasn't always been a priority. In fact, most research historically has occurred in people of Northern European or European descent and has left other groups unstudied. People are working hard to address this. And yet we have examples where diversity has led to stunning discoveries that wouldn't have been found if it weren't for both a diverse team and a diverse set of trial participants. Professor Hannah Valentine is a professor of medicine at Stanford University and an expert on cardiac transplant, especially how to manage and avoid organ rejection. She has worked intensely with microbiologists to understand the infections that may be in transplanted hearts and with bioengineers to figure out ways to sense when a heart is being stressed out in its new environment. During her career, she realized that diversity of the team, both the researchers and the study participants, was critical for new discoveries. In fact, she became so convinced that she took time off to take a job in the federal government, the National Institutes of Health, to be the chief officer for scientific workforce diversity in order to bring these insights to a national scale and to benefit all of science. Hannah. After establishing yourself as a distinguished scientist in heart transplant and cardiology, you kind of did a pivot in your career to thinking a lot about team science, diversity in medicine and in science more generally. Where did that decision come from and how has it gone? Well, uh, that, thank you for that wonderful question. Um, it actually came from my own personal experience going through the ranks and being promoted from assistant professor to full professor, where I realized a couple of things. First of all, in the research for which I was passionate, it wasn't possible to do high quality research without collaboration, without team science. In fact, my most successful research was when I collaborated with basic scientists and when we studied the role of cytomegalovirus in causing blockages of coronary arteries of the transplanted heart, for which I collaborated with um, virologists here, Ed Murkowski, we had a large program project grant, and that led to much better discoveries than I had done toiling away by myself in the lab with the rats or even simply trying to put together patient data and uh, doing um, uh, statistical analysis on them. So that's where the team signs and that's where the collaboration came in. And the diversity part of it came from really something that has been with me for the very longest time, this realization that if only you're given a chance, if only you're given an opportunity, you can actually contribute so greatly to diversity, to, to actually the science and the, uh, the management of patients. And I started to read about this idea that diversity in science might actually lead to better innovations and better outcomes for patients in general. And so that's where that came from, this gradual realization of the importance of diversity in science. And where has it gone? I think it's gone pretty well. Um, uh, from the collaboration point of view, as you know, my last major collaboration was with a fantastic bioengineer here at Stanford, Steve Quake, when we discovered that cell-free DNA could be used as a way to monitor patients after organ transplantation, not only, by the way, for rejection, but also for infection and it has swept the whole field. Yes. Now it's being used, it started in cardiac transplantation, it's being used clinically 
kidney transplantation, liver transplantation, and even cell transplantation. It's so, absolutely extraordinary. So this is fascinating, and I do want to get to that because I know that that work is both exciting and is also an example of this diversity argument that, that you've put forward. Now, you didn't just realize the value of diversity and, and kind of take advantage of this secret sauce in your own work. You actually took a little bit of time to serve uh, the federal government to try to bring this not just to your own research program, but to research programs all over. And I'm wondering what that experience was like. Is this argument that diversity improves science? I guess I have two questions. The first one is, do we mean diversity of intellectual background or do we mean diversity in a much broader uh, sense than just your intellectual training, like what your degree is in? Because in those examples, you said you took a bioengineer and a cardiologist and magic happened. Um, that's kind of a narrow sense of diversity. And I'm wondering, what is your sense of the definition of diversity in science? Yeah, my, sen my definition is that it's broad. Because not only do we have uh, diversity of uh, disciplines and experience, which we know is where the foundational work for team science has been done and proven when you come together and to the extent that it becomes not only interdisciplinary research, but transdisciplinary research, creating new language that is shared but also this diversity of identities and backgrounds. And because at the behind that kind of diversity, there is a diversity of experience and life experience. When you come to ask uh, to, a partic to solve a particular problem, that difference in your life experience lets you ask a different question. Mm -hmm. a different kind of question to the research in a way that somebody from a different life experience might not even have thought of. Gotcha. And so that in and of itself results in a broader pers perspective of the research and therefore uh, better solutions to complex problems. Because as you, I'm sure, know, the, the problems that we face in solving health and, um, and longevity uh, are quite complex. So it's a broad definition of diversity that I'm talking about. And let me add, it's not just identity diversity, and it's not just the diversity in the science. It's bringing the two together and thinking deeply about how diversity how we can think about diversity in the research that we do. So I have to ask, because you, you were at the National Institutes of Health and you were the chief officer for scientific workforce diversity. And that, as we all know, is in Washington, D.C., which is one of the places that I might imagine resistance uh, from some to these ideas. So tell me, how how... How do you make the case to somebody who is skeptical about the value of diversity uh, to show them that this really works? I mean, is it individual stories? Is it statistics? Is it a combination? And how well do those arguments go over with the skeptics? Yes. Um, you use every single one of those tools and more <laughs> is required with the skeptics because uh, if you step back 20 years ago, when we all started this work in diversity, the, uh, the retort from the skeptics would be, well, this, you know, science has nothing to do with diversity. Uh, it, it's nice to have, but not essential. And of course, all of the quantitative data linking diversity, identity diversity with output came from the business world, as you know. Yes. More gender diversity in higher positions, the better the, the, the output in terms of money, which is easier to measure, really, than the quality of science that we do. That in itself is not enough. The business case is not enough for the general scientists. And for them, it requires walking through examples of yeah. how not the diversity of the science itself works. So the classic example that most of us point to these days is the discovery of the PCSK9 inhibitors by Helen Hobbs. And when she was 
doing that work and doing genome sequencing just on cell samples, genomes. And, and just for people, people who don't know that, this is a very exciting discovery related to coronary artery disease and some major new classes of drugs that can right. interfere with high cholesterol. That's abs absolutely, I was going to get to that. And Sorry. initially, her discovery work uh, started with looking at genomes to looking at various mutations that might affect either high or low cholesterol. And there was nothing in the readout when she was just looking at genomes from people from European ancestry. But when she broadened it and started to look at uh, genomes from Africans, she found this mutation that was associated with lowering of cholesterol known as loss of function mutation. And that led to the development of the most powerful drug that there is for cholesterol. So that's within the science. And that kind of example is compelling for a scientist to have them broadening their scope of research and, and, uh, and do it in a way that it will uh, result in better results. Now, the identity diversity, that's a tough one to sell mm -hmm. scientists, and I'm still struggling with that. Um, but I think there has been a general shift in the right direction, slight, not completely. There are a lot of skeptics that say, well, it doesn't matter at all, science is science, and we just have to continue to work on it, quite frankly. But just to be clear, in the business world, even the identity issue has been resolved. Is it clear that the identity diversity does help in the business money world, or is that also in question? Yeah, well, the greatest, uh, the greatest data is um, for uh, women in leadership positions in the business world. And that was really boiled down to dollars and cents of how companies with more women leaders were more successful. Racial diversity, on the other hand, because the numbers are so still so small, I would say um, has not been as well proven um, as uh, even in the business world um, as gender. And I, and I must say, I find it ironic that the burden of proof is on people who are saying, why don't we include everybody? And there's, it's kind of amazing that there's a group who would say, well, prove to me we should include everybody before I do it. But let's, yeah. let's put that aside. I want to talk a little bit about your scientific work because it actually is not unrelated. Uh, I think we're going to get to some conclusions related to diversity, even going to the very science. So you made a little reference to this idea of um, liquid, uh, so the so-called liquid biopsies for uh, detecting transplant uh, rejection uh, um, and also viral infections and many things. So I wonder if we could just step back and if you could just give us the lay of the land of what motivated that work uh, and where is it now? And then we can talk about how team science and diversity even impacted that. Yes. So uh, for the, my entire career, I have been in search of a non-invasive way of diagnosing rejection of the transplanted heart. And quite honestly, the reason was because the procedure that we performed was quite gruesome, where you had to pass a big catheter into the neck in the large uh, jugular vein and take a tiny bit of uh, sample from the transplanted heart. In fact, one of my patients once said to me, Dr. Valentine, first you give me a heart, then you take it away bit by bit. <laughs> that was the first, that was uh, not so good. And then I myself doing a biopsy was astonished to hold out and see not only a piece of heart muscle, but strings which were clearly, I'd snipped off part of the tricuspid valve. Horrible. Uh, that, that is not the horrible. goal, not the goal. That is, is not the goal. So I've been working on this initially through echocardiography, but the breakthrough came when my colleague in bioengineering started to do this work uh, using um, for, for prenatal diagnosis. And the idea is simple. It's simply that you have two genomes. One is from the transplanted organ and the other is from the donor, from the recipient. And so it is not at all unlikely that tiny little fragments of DNA 
might come out of the donor organ and circulate in this recipient blood. And you might then be able to identify that and that could be a sign of a damage or rejection to the heart. And when Steve Quake joined us, um, I saw his work for prenatal diagnosis and we got together and started talking about it and he said, of course, this is highly likely to work. After all, an organ transplant is a genome transplant. And I, I see. Thought so that just was to be really clear, the, the initial work was the mom and the baby, and they were looking at the baby's DNA to, to detect any kind of um, uh, ab abnormalities or, or disease states that they would need to know about before the birth. But you said to Steve, wait a minute, I also, it's not a baby now, it's a new heart, which also has its own DNA from the, from the donor, and can we do a similar thing? And that's where the two of you kind of got together. Absolutely, that's where it all started, and um, I, uh, we did our proof of concept experiment in some bloods that, uh, that we had uh, biobanked and stored. And it was clear that we could detect fragments of DNA that came from the donor circulating in the recipient's blood and that we could measure the amount of it. And now we have a blood test that has completely replaced the biopsy. That's the state of the art. And it's been transplanted now, um, use, adopted, shall I say, by other organ transplants for kidney transplant, for which there are many more performed every year in this country. And so I think that, you know, we're on a way towards completely eliminating the need for a heart biopsy. But not only that, not only that, we can use the same technologies to understand what's going on with rejection and perhaps even to figure out why it is that, for example, African Americans who have a transplant are more likely to develop a rejection of this or transplanted organ than their European counterparts. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Hannah Valentine next on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel 132. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman and I'm speaking with Professor Hannah Valentine from Stanford University. In the last segment, Hannah told us how diversity in scientific teams can catalyze new discoveries. In this segment, she will tell us how a more diverse set of patients in clinical research led to unexpected discoveries about the nature and causes of heart transplant. These were found in African-American patients, but they're gonna benefit all heart transplant patients. In addition, she has thoughts about how to best ensure that effective new medical technologies are broadly and quickly adopted by practicing physicians, not something that's always easy. At the end of the last segment, Hannah, you made a very interesting comment that outcomes for African Americans for heart transplant are not the same. Uh, and this is a very high tech procedure, and I'm sure the doctors are trying to exercise all the same care in doing the transplant. So what do we know about the nature of that gap in outcomes, and is there anything we can do about it? Yeah. The nature of the outcome is that it's quite severe, that um, African Americans are twice more likely than their European counterparts to get having an ex experience of re rejection, and even uh, 10 times more likely to develop the severe forms of rejection called antibody-mediated rejection. And so this that is huge. means, this is huge, huge. And that means that uh, for heart transplantation, they're more likely to die because you don't have an opportunity necessarily to have a second heart. So the outcomes are very important. And it used to be um, wrongly assumed that the African-American patients just rejected because they were poorly compliant. They didn't take their medication. And then afterwards, it became uh, uh, apparent that the metabolism of the key drugs that we use are slightly different for African-Americans and Europeans, meaning that African-Americans need higher doses. And even when they get higher doses, this rejection likelihood is still present, that they have more rejection. And is I was there able- any, is, If I could just ask, is there any need to use African-American hearts as donors to African-American recipients, or is that not an issue? It's a debatable issue. 
because researchers like myself have done studies to see whether if you put a heart from an African-American into an African-American or you put a heart from a European-American into an African-American, is there a difference in outcomes? And the studies are very mixed. Some say that there is less likelihood of rejection if the donor and recipient are race concordant. And some say there is absolutely no different. And it's, hard, it's really uh, hard to know where that is. Um, and it, but I think the re part of the reason is biological, because the African-American um, have, a, you know, there is a greater heterogeneity of the HLA and genomes. And so um, it's more likely that as an African-American, you're going to get less of a good Histologic, uh, histo biochemical match yes. um, than if you were a European, but we don't know any of that, and that was the beauty of my the second part of my work at NIH, where I developed a cohort of 500 patients, 40 percent of whom are African American, and so now we are able to apply these new genomic technologies hand in hand with studying the social determinants of health. And we're really hopeful that we will be able to get a deep understanding of why it is that African Americans are more likely to reject their transplanted organs. And I know that you're quite optimistic that this gap in outcomes is very addressable uh, and will narrow over time, maybe even soon. Uh, is that, and, and, and what is the chief source of that optimism? Because that's very good news. Yeah, well, one of the things is that we, what we're seeing is that the type of rejection is really triggered by uh, a mitochondrial DNA that gets into the circul circulation and stimulates, revs up the immune system to reject the heart. Now, we know that there are agents that block the effects of this uh -huh. uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA in ways that we have not thought about before and that might not be blocked by our standard immunosuppressive drugs that we currently use. So that's why I'm optimistic, is this idea that there is a new pathway that we've never even considered before that is leading to rejection, particularly in the African-American patients. Yes. And, and I'm now circling back to the first part of our conversation. I would imagine that those kinds of markers will be also useful and will benefit all transplant patients. And so this will be another example where a diversity of both participants in research and the scientific team led to it basically floating all the boats. Absolutely. Absolutely. The targeting uh, of that work will benefit everybody. And that's the beauty of team science. Yeah. And that's the beauty of diversity in science, that so, the discoveries so will likely benefit everybody. It really is fantastic. So now I want to go to, a, I think, a tough question, which is you mentioned at the end of the last segment that you look forward to the time where you won't have to do heart biopsies. But that implied to me that there still are heart biopsies happening. And that raises the issue of how do you get your fellow physicians to accept these new technologies? The, the liquid biopsy where they're checking blood instead of taking a biopsy of the heart, and now you're gonna tell them about mitochondrial DNA and what they need to do in order to avoid rejection. Um, I'm guessing that your fellow physicians don't just roll over and say, whatever you say, Hannah, that's what we're gonna do. Um, so tell me about the, the barriers and the outlook for getting these into routine practice. Yes, the, these are very much psychosocial issues. The people, especially physicians, are very accustomed to following the rules. You know, Russ, we have orders. When you're on the wards, somebody writes an order. The, the chief resident writes an order and you have to follow. Now, the order for 40 years has been biopsies. Right. But on top of that, there is a financial gain, I'm afraid to say, for doing biopsies. The cardiologists make money, the cath labs make money, mm. and the pathologists make money. And so to take all that away is really, really challenging. In fact, one of the first grants I ever wrote was proposing that echocardiography would replace biopsy. And when my 
husband saw it, he said, oh my God, you're likely to get shot. You're talking about <laughs> taking everybody's likelihood, uh, li livelihood away. And so it has to be done gradually. But I think our most um, likely area of success is when we have coordinated care. When we have it done within a system where we know that we're using resources to the best of our ability. And it's really quite interesting that some of these non-invasive um, innovations have been taken up most rapidly by, guess who? Kaiser, because it's ah. coordinated care. Um, it was, you know, the last, last set of innovations I did was uh, gene expression profiling, which is quite good, but not quite as good as the cell-free DNA. And it was immediately adopted by our Kaiser colleagues with whom we work with, who look after heart transplant patients. But I couldn't convince my colleagues here at Stanford to stop doing the biopsy. <laughs> so this is interesting. So, so I, I guess nobody should be surprised that the ways in which people are paid will be will affect their behavior. But this is an example where, and, and just to make it clear for people who are not into the details of health uh, reimbursement, at Kaiser you pay a fixed sum, and they take care of you. And so they have a motivation to get good outcomes, as good outcomes as possible. Uh, in the most inexpensive way. In other healthcare systems, you are paid for what you do, not for the outcomes of the patient. And so um, the difference might be, for example, that some of your colleagues were being paid every time they did a heart biopsy, whether or not it led to an improved outcome. And so this raises, I, I don't know if you have anything you wanna say about this, but I would like to give you a platform. Uh, this raises very deep questions about how healthcare works, at least in America. And I'm yeah. wondering if, uh, if look, at sitting in a federal position uh, and looking at it as a physician, if you drew any conclusions about this. Yes, I, I must say I am totally in support of the coordinated care system. I, I, I think that's where we get the, both, the, the best care. And look, Kaiser, I don't know whether you're following this, is one of those um, uh, systems that has managed to reduce the gap, the, the, the healthcare outcomes gap uh, that exists between um, uh, different patients and their outcomes. And so uh, reducing that gap, that health equity, creating health equity is going to be, cr is critically important and Kaiser has been successful. And it's a, a classic example of coordinating care, which is not as good as in other healthcare systems. So I think, um, one of the ways forwards will be have to be through coordinated care, but unfortunately, uh, we need other approaches as well to, to, to get there. Thanks to Hannah Valentine. That was the future of diversity in medical research. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel 132.